Okay, thank you, uh, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the um, inaugural public lecture in the series um, organized by the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and the uh, Georgetown Institute for Global History. This is a uh, series of public lectures and workshops that's entitled The New Middle East, The First World War 100 Years Later. I'm Osama Vimershid, the director of the uh, Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, and I would like to begin by thanking Professor Mustafa Aksakal for his leading role in conceptualizing and organizing uh, the lecture series. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, my thanks also to my colleagues, Professors Rochelle Davis, Fida Adeli, and uh, Joseph Sassoon for their invaluable input in uh, forming this series and putting it together. And obviously, last but not least, thank you to the staff of the CCS um, and specifically to our public affairs coordinator, Elizabeth Sexton, uh, for planning and arranging tonight's event. Now, it's always a special thrill for me to introduce scholars who figured so prominently on my comps reading list. Um, <laughs> and I'm simply honored and delighted to be able to host tonight's distinguished speaker, Professor uh, L. Carl Brown. Professor, you don't know this, of course, but you and I have already spent a lot of time together. Um, you're, just, you're just not aware of it. Um, L. Carl Brown is Garrett Professor Emeritus in Foreign Affairs and Professor Emeritus of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. He's a historian of the modern Near East and North Africa and holds a PhD from Harvard Uni University in History and Middle Eastern Studies. He was a member of the Princeton faculty from 1966 until his retirement in 1993. And during this time, he served as chairman of the Department of Near Eastern Studies and as director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Near Eastern Studies. Professor Brown is also a founding member of the American Institute of Maghribi Studies and of the Middle East uh, Studies Association, to which he was elected president in 1975-1976. He is the author, uh, editor, or co-editor of many seminal works in the field of Middle East uh, Studies and North African Studies, uh, and most notably, among his works was the Tunisia of Ahmed Bey that was published in 1975, International Politics in the Middle East, Old Rules, Dangerous Game, published in 1984, but obviously um, maybe more relevant than ever uh, today. Franco-Arab Encounters, one of my uh, preferred readings from 1996. Religion and State, The Muslim Approach to Politics, published in 2000, and Diplomacy in the Middle East, The International Relations of Regional and Outside pa uh, Powers, published in 2001. And in 2005, Professor Brown earned the Arkansas Arabic Translation Award for his rendering of the Muqaddama of 19th century Tunisian bureaucrat and reformer Ahmad ibn Abi Diath. Uh, so clearly, we could not hope for a more eminent guest speaker uh, to launch our lecture series. And I'm very grateful, for, um, very grateful to Professor Brown for accepting our invitation to share his um, profound insights with us. His lecture is entitled, The Middle Eastern Dimension of World War I, A Century of History and Historiography. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor L. Carl Brown. I'm not quite of the generation of the First World War, but I'm close, and I ask your indulgence to permit me to remain seated because I, 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 don't, I get a little bit uh, weary standing up. I just want to say how uh, happy I am to be at Georgetown for a variety of reasons. Several old friends like, like John Gold and his wife Sarah, uh, Paul Heck, uh, uh, and Diane Singerman from across the way at American University, uh, people who I've known in the past and have, have not been able to keep up with as much as I would like, but it's, it is so gratifying to see them. And I'm especially honored that they've taken the trouble to come to hear this old windbag uh, uh, talk on, on this subject. I also want to remind that I have a, sp a special attachment to Georgetown in that my oldest son, Joseph Winchester Brown, Win as we call him, uh, was a graduate of the a BA, or actually BS graduate, of the Ling Lang Department way back in 1983, I think it was. So it's, uh, it's uh, to some extent, like uh, a homecoming to come back. Is my voice projecting okay for everyone in the 
Uh, well, I, I would appreciate it if, if, if it's not doing so either, depending on how you react to what I have to say, uh, either waving your arm and I'll talk louder or more distinctly or slower, or simply leave because I'm not saying much anything. <laughs> now, let me begin. As we approach the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War, what is the public perception of the Middle Eastern dimension of this brutal four-year confrontation? One might begin the, to answer this question by saying somewhat facetiously that the Middle Eastern part of the history can be reduced to a few phrases or sound bites. Hussein McMahon, Sykes P. Cole, Balfour, twice promised land. Holy War made in Germany, Lawrence of Arabia. To these can be added the notion that the First World War, a somewhat more sophisticated notion, that the First World War in the Middle East was something of a sideshow. What mattered took place in Europe among Europeans. Now, I want us to share together the question of what really was the Middle Eastern dimension of this First World War. And let me begin by pointing out that among other things, this four-year confrontation brought down the lives of three, four long-lived empires, Austro-Hungarian, German, Russian, Ottoman. So by just that statistic, hardly a sideshow, at least 25 percent of the, of the big picture. Moreover, the spark that ignited World War I took place in the Balkans, an area that had loosened its long-standing Ottoman ties only throughout the previous century, the 19th century. Indeed, one could invoke, one could evoke that distinctive pattern of politics long since dubbed the Eastern Question, involving European powers great and small with the Ottoman Empire since the late 18th century, and assert that the outbreak of the First World War was yet another Eastern Question cycle of balance of power diplomacy involving Europe and the Middle East that unlike on previous occasions went awry. Whereas earlier crises in this Eastern Question arena, that is to say the Balkans and the Middle East, whereas earlier crises had been settled either short of war or following short wars, with the Crimean War in the mid-19th century, in the 1850s, being a partial uh, 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 exception. This time, there was total war, four years of war. The Middle Eastern, the Middle Eastern dimension, geographically and diplomatically, I suggest, was certainly more than a sideshow. Admittedly, the Middle Eastern dimension of the First World War looms less large when set alongside the estimated total casualties for that four-year inferno. Uh, casualties, uh, just to remind you, is both killed, wounded, prisoners, and missing in action. The grand total of casualties in the First World War, allies and central powers, was roughly 37 and a half million. And the overall, now get this, the overall casualty figure as a percentage of the armed forces involved is a gruesing 57.5%. More, somewhat more than half of those who were uh, in arms in one or of the several uh, armies, both central powers and allies, uh, somewhat more than half were casualties. For the Ottoman Empire, the, uh, the figure is admittedly just is, is a bit lower. It's just about 34%. Now, I would suggest from all of this, the, th the three things I've mentioned, it seems fair to conclude, using the circus metaphor, that the Middle East during the First World War was inside the big tent, but not perhaps the center ring. And those figures of Ottoman losses, while less considerably less than the figures of, of uh, 
losses of the central powers and allies in uh, Europe and the other theaters, it, it was certainly enormous enough, 24%, somewhat uh, roughly one-third of, of those who were uh, recruited into the army uh, uh, were casualties. In any case, our chosen subject is the Middle Eastern dimension of the First World War, and that is a subject worthy of careful study in its own right. Yet there is another issue of defining our subject that needs attending to. And all of us involved in the Middle East and Middle Eastern studies or Near Eastern studies know this. It's the question of definition. We have thus far spoken of the Middle East and the Ottoman Empire as if they were one and the same. At least until the latter, the Ottomans, after centuries of existence, were tossed into the dust bin of history, leaving behind what became the Republic of Turkey and sundry other territories that eventually became states as well. I might mention in passing, as an Arabist and who's dealt mainly with the Arab world, not with the Anatolia and what is now Turkey, I've always taken issue with uh, Bernard Lewis's splendid book, The Emergence of Modern Turkey, because it should be entitled and it should deal with the emergence of modern Turkey and the Afro-Asian successor states. Uh, just leaving my Tunisia and, and uh, Osama's uh, Algeria, not, not to mention others, uh, in limbo. But that's, that's a problem within a problem. Here the problem is the normal, the conventional Western sense, the Western tendency, to see the Middle East in, in, the, in the First World War as kind of a sideshow. Another a sort of internal problem among uh, those of us dealing with Middle Eastern studies is that between uh, not paying adequate attention to the, uh, both, both the Ottoman, the, or the inner linkages of the Ottoman, but not, not paying sufficient attention to the fact that w at some point along the way, and this is a history that needs to be uh, carried uh, considered, at some point along the way, they went their separate ways and created the Republic of Turkey and e uh, Syria, Egypt, you name it, all the way over to uh, uh, Algeria. Now, back to definition, it's all, it's the old chestnut about what do you call this area and how do you define it? Levant, Near East, Middle East and North Africa with a nice acronym MENA, Southwest Asia and North Africa, SWANA, which is the closest to being uh, uh, accurate, very good, Southwest Asia and North Africa. But for, it sounds, I think, for all the world like uh, uh, Stephen Collins Foster uh, song, and it, it hasn't really uh, picked up, I, I fear. Uh, now, one might argue it doesn't matter. We can always take the Humpty Dumpty ploy. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. Nothing more, nothing less. But I think the subject deserves a little bit more than that. And I would suggest yet another definition of the Middle East, but one that takes in my cherished mugrim that does justice to uh, Turkey and Iran and all of the Arab world, it would go something like this. The Middle East, I suggest, can best be de described of what was before 1914, what remained of the Ottoman Empire shorn of its European holdings in the Balkans and left with only a toehold in, e in, in Europe, bookended, as it were, geographically bookended by Morocco on the west, which of course, as we all know, was never part of the Ottoman Empire, and Iran on the east. And that gives us, uh, uh, it seems to me, uh, uh, an, an adequate coverage, which I would commend uh, to the attention of this conference, this ongoing uh, conference and, and, and seminar. Uh, uh, now, Ottoman Empire, Morocco on the west, Iran on the east, 
are all centralized political units of long standing, of a different dimension, of different size and the like, but, uh, but, Im but important of all three. This is not like uh, parts of Soviet or Russian Central Asia <coughs> or the Arabian Peninsula or uh, the northern part of uh, Mali and the like today of, of desert expanse and so on. These are integrated uh, state systems with their history going back centuries in all cases. And yet, moving up to the First World War and uh, trying to zero in on the, uh, the Middle Eastern dimension of all of this, uh, the Ottoman Empire was for all practical purposes the sole state with the sole army of the three capable of significant independent political and military action. So clearly, as, as, as works that I'll be citing later uh, may, may, may make, uh, make clear, uh, clearly the Ottoman dimension of the Middle Eastern dimension of the First World War is going to be overwhelming, at least in terms of political military history. It has to be. It's the only one, again, uh, Morocco had just recently uh, been uh, taken up as a French protectorate. Uh, Iran had been divided between uh, uh, the so uh, Russia uh, and, and Britain into spheres of influence. Iran and Russia, of course, uh, to add to my Eastern question metaphor, uh, the Iran, as in between Russia and, and Great Britain, it's, it's not so much the Middle East that we moved the other great soundbite, is the great game, with so many first 19th century British talked about this uh, jockeying for position, securing India, as, as it was seen, against, uh, 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 against the possibility of Russia coming down uh, from the passes uh, into India itself. But again, keep in mind the way in which the great game and the Eastern question, it's all of a piece in which there are great numbers of European powers jockeying with each other over the bait for which they are fighting being essentially in our Middle East. And now, I've brought the thing up to 1914, but a further downsizing of the Ottoman Empire needs to be uh, 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 laid out. Because the Ottoman Empire, by 1914, had lost not only its, its toehold in, uh, uh, in, in Europe, it was virtually, it was no longer a European power for all practical purposes, but just look let me just tick off in the dates the, the number of Ottoman territories lost to European colo colonialism throughout the 19th century. Algeria, 1830. Aden, Aden, 1839, to the British, Algeria to the French. Tunisia, 1881, to the French. Egypt, 1882, to the British, or most unusual combination, to just British occupation for almost a generation until Egypt was suddenly declared a protectorate. How many years after 18, 20, so many years after 1882, in 1914. Now why did suddenly the British feel obliged to declare a protectorate when they had jogged along very nicely all along, all those years from 1882 on to 1914. And the answer, surely, is, of course, the outbreak of the First World War. And the Egypt had, had continued to be the nominal uh, uh, territory of the Ottoman Empire, but for all practical purposes, it was totally controlled by the British. To continue, Kuwait in the 1890s, Libya to the Italians in 1911, and the Persian Gulf states throughout the 19th century establishing 
what can best be described as a pattern of informal protectorate. Now, what does this mean for the Central Ottoman Empire, which I've already insisted is the only political military unit capable of autonomous action throughout the First World War. And uh, we need to keep in mind the, uh, the limitations on, on them. I think the best way to present that is uh, the, that first, the Ottoman Empire in 1914 had a much higher percentage of Muslims as, as compared to, to non-Muslims than the Ottoman Empire, say, a century earlier or something. But just how big and uh, important was the Ottoman Empire may best be conveyed by this statistic that in 1914, the Ottoman Empire had uh, some, uh, an estimated population of 25 million. Britain, colonial Britain, imperial Britain, controlled uh, Muslims roughly three times that number, 100 million. France and Russia, both had controlled a uh, 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 Muslim population roughly similar uh, to that of the Ottomans. Each had roughly 20 million Muslim subjects living under European colonialism. All this then, to sum up, leaves us with the truncated Ottoman Empire as one, the only Middle Eastern force capable of mil political and military action during the, the First World War, but in itself a very weakened entity, especially having come off recent defeats in the Balkans and in Italy. Thus, I appear to be maybe playing both sides of the street. The Middle East, I say, had an important role in the First World War, but the political forces within the Middle East had very, very few resources to play in this. My answer would be more or less as follows. First, given the downsizing of the Ottoman Empire, the, our being made aware of the fact that, so, that, that the Ottoman Empire was the last great Muslim state standing, but still it was a pretty truncated state by comparison with the Ottoman Empire at its peak. And I would say that makes all the more impressive the military actions that the Ottoman army carried out in, th in the First World War. Now, also something I'll come to later, the fact that the Ottoman Empire was the uh, single important independent Muslim polity in the globe, it, it makes it clear that the, no, the, no, the celebrated or notorious November 1914 fatwa issued by the uh, Sheikh al-Islam uh, in, 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 uh, in the Ottoman Empire appealed to the Ottomans and frightened the colonial powers. But I'll, I'll come to that later. I should also mention uh, en passant, that uh, uh, Mustafa uh, Aksakal has a stimulating article that takes a somewhat different uh, reading on the, on the uh, uh, fatwa, but we'll come to that later. In any case then, our goal is not to write the history of just the winners, or for that matter, just the losers, but to set out the broad lines of what changes took place in the Middle East during these four years and their implications for future developments. I will try to accomplish this in the next few minutes by presenting a number of separate topics that taken together may add up to a very broad gauge interpretation of the Middle East in the years of the First World War. And to those of you who know 
the president of Princeton University, who was later president of the United States, and to those of you all who are interested, for the good reasons or bad, in Lawrence of Arabia, I would like to make a, an apt point of saying I have chosen to set out my broad gauge interpretation in 14 points <laughs> rather than seven pillars of wisdom. Now first, what was the military role of the Ottomans during the First World War? My answer is the first, and it's a very some, all of these are very summary answers, they have to be. Uh, the Ottomans during the First World War put an estimated total of 2.6 million, 2,600,000 2, uh, men in uniform. Approximately 15% of the entire population or almost one out of every two adult males outside the civil service was called to arms. That's a citation directly from my successor uh, and colleague, Shukru Hanuolu, in his splendid book, A Brief History of the Late Ottoman Empire. That's kind of a double entendre, you know, the, the late Ottoman Empire. It is the deceased, but he also is dealing with the latter period of the Ottoman Empire, not, not all four plus five centuries. The several Ottoman military campaigns included extended operations against Russia in the Caucasus and beyond, which are, are even more ignored uh, by most Western uh, otherwise informed people. That was, that was quite a, uh, uh, an enterprise. And it was often with disastrous losses on the part of the Ottomans, as detailed in the recent book by Michael Reynolds, Shattering Empires, The Clash and Collapse of the Ottoman and Russian Empires, 1908-1918. Michael Reynolds is uh, a young colleague in the active faculty at Princeton. Sh Shukru Hanayoru is a uh, uh, chairman of the department and director of the program uh, in the Eastern Studies at Princeton. <coughs> and you may think I've been sent down here by the Public Relations Office uh, to, uh, to talk about Princeton. Mustafa got his degree there. And who knows, maybe I, deep, deep down, that's what I'm up to. But uh, I'll just have to call them as I see them. Uh, <coughs> there were several operations against British forces, including two unsuccessful drives uh, toward the Suez Canal, operations in Mesopotamia, what is now Iraq, <coughs> including the successful Ottoman siege of Kut, some 100 miles south of Baghdad, from December 1915 to April 1916, resulting in the surrender of some 13,000 uh, Allied troops, British troops, mainly or largely uh, Indian. I always enjoyed the little uh, story. I mean, the, 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 this, uh, we, we've all who study this poor area just have to uh, uh, attune ourselves to, to dealing with gr great numbers of, of horrible tales, Holocaust, uh, Armenian get genocide, we'll come to that uh, 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 later. Uh, and the condition of the British troops trapped in the siege of Kut was just ho horrendous. And it is best conveyed by a Cockney British sto uh, soldier. I have to remind you, uh, in case you don't know it, that in, Br in British India, the uh, uh, high places in the mountains were called hill stations for, it's, it's sort of like, uh, Going, going to, to Maine uh, in the summer uh, were called hill stations. And one Cockney soldier who was trapped in the siege there at, uh, at Kut said that Kut is the place for which hell is a hill station. <laughs> I think that conveys what's going on there. There were as well campaigns in Arabia in the Fertile Crescent, that is to say the celebrated Arab revolt of Sharif Hussein of Mecca against his Ottoman sovereign 
led by Lawrence of Arabia, or not even, not, that's not technically true, advised by Lawrence of Arabia, it was led by uh, Sharif's sons, uh, but more accurately, in terms of military manpower and results, it was the successful British campaign, mainly British troops, uh, with the great Indian, British Indian input of General Allenby. I will return to uh, later to uh, uh, expatiate a little bit more on my reservations about Lawrence of Arabia. But most important and most illustrious was the successful Ottoman, with German support, stand against the Allies at the Dardanelles, the Gallipoli campaign, in which Mustafa Kemal, later Ataturk, played a major role. A measure of the Ottoman role in the First World War can be conveyed in that Britain deployed in over two and a half million troops against Ottomans in the various arenas, uh, the various fronts of the, of the uh, M Middle East. Britain deployed over two and a half million troops, Russia 700,000 troops, the French 50,000, and Italy had, having just recently uh, taken over uh, uh, Libya, sent some 70,000 troops to resist local revolts in Libya aided by the Ottomans. Second point, did Germany pressure the Ottoman Empire into an alliance leading to war? Just the opposite. The Ottoman leadership, sensing that survival depended on recruiting a great power ally and believing that the war would be short, like most people did, both in Europe and the Middle East, that the war would be short, as most wars in this whole Eastern question pattern throughout the 19th century had been, with the slight exception of the uh, Crimean War. Uh, after sounding out other potential allies, uh, it's, it's interesting to note that the Ottomans, uh, the Committee of Union and Progress there at, the, at this time, had uh, one or another of their leaders had tried to, uh, had, had sounded out the British at least three times, I think it is, uh, the, the, the French, even the Russians, their old, their old neighbor and enemy, and they ultimately chose Germany as much, or uh, more than Germany chose them. Now, that book is, that work, that complex situation is beautifully set out by our own Mustafa Aksak, Aksakal in his book, The Ottoman Road to War in 1914. Again, if I'm not sent by Princeton University, I'm sent by Princeton University Press because <laughs> they, that's the publisher of the book. Third point, I mentioned earlier as a sound bite, holy war made in Germany. What is wrong about, the, about that rubric? It's the title of a little 89-page book by a well-known Orientalist and colonial administrator in the Dutch East Indies, what is now Indonesia, Snook Hergronge, whose dates are 1857-1936, published in 1915 with the title, The Holy War, quote, Holy War, close quote, Made in Germany. Well, again, the Holy War, the Jihad, was not made in Germany. Uh, it, it fits into, as Mustafa has so clearly said, uh, set out in a, <coughs> in a separate article, it, it clearly fits in with the, uh, 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 the, the background. And one might say something you didn't say in your article, but uh, by comparison, uh, nations going to war tend to evoke uh, religio-political uh, symbols uh, uh, generally. After all, Eisenhower's uh, uh, memoir was entitled Crusade in Europe. And so uh, uh, Mustafa, to his credit, was, was, was showing us uh, the extent to which, yes, uh, <coughs> the Ottomans thought it was worth a try. Why not try? But they didn't stake that much on it. And it, f it fits into the, uh, uh, the pattern of earlier statements and earlier 
uh, confrontations. The claim that the idea of a fatwa announcing the duty of jihad against the enemies of the Ottoman Empire declared November 14, 1914, is a, uh, was that it was largely pushed by Germany is of a piece with the, with the idea that, that uh, the Germans inveigled the Ottomans into the war in the first place. And so both of those need to be cleared up. Did the fatwa, uh, point five, did the fatwa make a difference? Almost none. Little bits and pieces of, of uh, now again, in terms of the, of the work ahead for this uh, uh, project of, of what I think is intended to be a book at the end, in the light of what we know today about Islamist fundamentalist and uh, uh, terrorism and, and the like, one needs to probe again why was it was it, why, why was the impact so negative at this time? And maybe that leads us to uh, 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 an understanding which would make us, <coughs> would, which would help us, uh, among other things, appreciate in historical terms the present uh, existence of Salafiya groups, the, the rise of Sunni Shia antagonisms, and the, the, the whole business of Al-Qaeda and the like. Religio-political communities or political communities of a basic same religion tend to differ in how they approach things over time. Just as there was, let's say, in, 19th, in 18th century England, the great revival, uh, revivalist movements, fundamentalist movements at one time or another in, in the United States, reli Protestant religious fundamentalists. I guess I better say that here in Georgetown, to get you off the hook. Uh, <clears throat> I would just offer as a suggestion that the situation generally was not all that conducive for action taken in the name of Islam as opposed to other uh, actions taken in, in the name the name of other people. <coughs> but I, it seems to me th there's, uh, there's work to be done there. And in a sense, that's my sixth point, how to explain this fatwa, the, the almost negative, uh, uh, very limited impact of this fatwa back uh, at that time uh, as, as compared with radical Islam today. Uh, the, the just, in a sense, times change, but I do think a, a review of the record might be very useful. What military role, if any, was played by the peoples in the former Ottoman territories now under European colonial rule? First, a very interesting point is both the British and French recruited thousands, literally thousands, into their colonial, from their colonial possessions uh, into the army or into uh, active duty, either as soldiers or in labor battalions. Eighth point, and the home front in general, what about how things were taking place? What was their reaction? Uh, in uh, the Middle East. I, I will cite simply one very interesting uh, book by James Gelvin, not of Princeton, in his Divided Loyalties, Nationalism and Mass Politics in Syria at the Close of Empire. That is, uh, among other things, he's, he's arguing for a less elite-based development of new political thinking including Arab nationalism in Syria uh, during those years, but also he and other books that I don't have right at my fingertips, but other books have, uh, are doing a good job of pointing out how excruciatingly painful for the entire greater Syria area uh, 
the war in 1914 to 18 was uh, uh, especially uh, in this area. Uh, the, the, the Allied blockade, which, which was quite successful by sea, the effort, understandable, but still brutal, brutally implemented, the effort by the Ottoman uh, government uh, to uh, squeeze every resource possible uh, out of the territory, leaving uh, starvation and disease and all the rest uh, in, uh, in greater Syria. What about our two geographical bookends to the Ottoman Empire, Morocco on the west, Iran in the east? What was their uh, position uh, in the uh, First World War? Well, <clears throat> Morocco had just recently come under French rule, French protectorate rule. It was just getting under, the, the, uh, the, the establishment of the French protectorate was really just getting underway when the great leader of that movement, Marshal Laiote, was called back to, to serve uh, on the Western Front in Europe. Uh, and uh, in a sense, Morocco was totally absorbed in resisting the establishment of the French protectorate, but not playing any role beyond that. I've already mentioned as far as the Eastern bookend goes, uh, uh, Iran had been divided into spheres of influence, the Russian and British, sphere, Russia in the north, Britain in the south, the great game, the, east, the eastern equivalent of the eastern question. Point 10, what is my hang up about Lawrence of Arabia? Well, now, I might mention in, uh, uh, that the uh, a, mag uh, a massive biography of Lawrence of Arabia, uh, uh, and Dad, blame it, I've forgotten the name, but I, uh, 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 a prince of our disorder, John Mack, John Mack, a, a Harvard psychiatrist, at a period of time when psychomography was very much uh, in, uh, spent uh, years doing a psychoanalytical biographical study of Lawrence of Arabia. And I, that was, uh, those were the years that I was at Harvard and I was in touch with him. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, <coughs> he asked me, like many, many graduate students will, uh, uh, what I thought about this or that interpretation, and then he went his own way. Uh, it, was, it is an important book in its own right, but not as a good history of what was taking place. In a word, I've, I've also, let me also mention how many times when I've uh, welcomed graduate students or undergraduates to Princeton for the first time and ask them, well, how in the world did you get in, uh, do you happen to get interested in the Middle East? Did you, have, you, have you lived there or uh, had a family connections uh, with it, uh, or, or right? And how very often Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> I read about Lawrence of Arabia. And, uh, now, I have no objection to anybody uh, uh, becoming a, a star in his, his or her own, own right, but as a historian, I, I worry about the fact that the myth of Lawrence, all of that agonizing and uh, agony he went through in his uh, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, uh, it just is not good history it's good history of his uh, mindset and his disturbances, but it's just simply not good history of what took place in the Arab Revolt. And also, I think it's fair, it's time to, to, to realize that uh, uh, there's there some other books that, that, that catch me going two different ways in that 
books by sort of adamantly, uh, rigorously, antagonistically pro-Zionist people, for example, often try to demean the Arab awakening and the Arab revolt by saying it was really all uh, uh, kind of stuff and nonsense. But in a sense, again, as a historian, I have to admit that it was not such a big deal. Yes, the British promised things to, to the Arab, not to all Arabs, but to those who were involved in the Arab revolt, uh, and didn't fulfill the promise. There's just no two ways about it. They, like any good lawyer, they had a way to explain it all and after the fact, but that's just, that's just a fact. Uh, but just as, as a good historian trying to understand what really happened and what are the implications of it, we need to set Lawrence in a much more modest role than many people uh, give him. Actually, a more important role was played all the way over in that western bookend of my uh, Middle East, Morocco, later in the 1920s, the 19, late the teens and 20s, a certain Abdul Krim. Now, Abdul Krim, in western terms, was a Riffian ruffian uh, from the Rift Mountains of, uh, of, uh, of, of Morocco, but he was a very effective a uh, resistance leader against Spanish and then later uh, French colonial domination uh, in, in, out, in, in Morocco. To such extent that at one, that at one time when he was finally brought to heel and, and forced to surrender, uh, one third of the French army at the time was engaged in putting him down in, in, in Morocco. Now, Abdul Krim was a mountaineer. But back to the Lawrence mystique, the revolt in the desert, when Sigmund Rongberg decided to write an operetta about, uh, about these events of Abdul Krim's time, that we were very much in the news, you know, you can catch these things. It should have been entitled The Mountain Song. But no, he realized as a good uh, artist that in the American image, it's got to be the desert song. In the same way, you all, or some uh, of the, some of you, I, I've learned the hard way when I say you all remember something of, say, the 1970s or something, there's a, there's a great glazing over of eyes. Uh, and here I'm talking about the 1920s. But how many... How many, just let, tell me, uh, uh, indulge me. How many have ever heard of Rudolph Valentino? Ooh, oh, wonderful. That's great. And what are some of the movies? Again, this would horrify Ling Lang department because it was the Sheik. Where is it supposed to be? The Sheik. But again, uh, this gets us, I think it is not irrelevant to our subject of the First World War in the, in the Middle East, we, we, we need to keep in mind the way in which images of the other, who we all have, can sometimes really distort uh, uh, reality. And this desert motif, this Lawrence myth, uh, is a very important step in that direction. Now, a more methodological point, point 11. How much military historians is needed, how much military history is needed by general historians, by, let's say, Middle Eastern experts, Middle, East, Middle Eastern historians, how much uh, do, do they need of military history? Now, I have to confess, in my own thinking, I, I began to, I realized uh, just almost too late that I tend to, in my historical studies, I tend to bring things up to the outbreak of warfare, pay considerable attention of why war broke out, 
but then kind of defer the whole thing and pick up the story after war is over. Now, we need more than that, but again, uh, here I'm talking, I'm, I guess, especially to faculty and graduate students, uh, but uh, I would hope it would be of, of some interest to, uh, to others as well. Uh, we can't, I think, become really uh, sufficiently conversant in military history as such, the history of military maneuvers and the like, uh, become uh, 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 appraised of, of, of uh, Jomini and other military tacticians over the years. Uh, we can't be, be expected to write a history of the First World War like literal heart uh, the British military historian did, but somewhere we, we need, I think, and I'm talking perhaps especially to myself, uh, we, we need to uh, somehow learn enough about military tactics, why, why certain armies succeed and others fail. Why were the German armies seemingly always so effective? We need to also uh, get involved in the whole issue of military advisory groups from one nation to another nation. It's a fascinating uh, history, uh, going back, of course, to the uh, uh, early uh, modernization efforts of the Ottoman Empire early in the 19th century. Point 13 the Armenian Massacre, or genocide, whether to use the word or not. Let me just quickly, I'm running out of time, let me just quickly say that I think uh, I would commend to your attention a, a book published in 2011, edited by Muge Gocek, Ronald Grigor Sunni, and Norman Maymark, multi-authored, A Question of Genocide, in which it's a combined group of Armenians, Turks, and third parties actually saying, look, obviously we all agree something terrible happened, that it involved hundreds of thousands, or maybe even, even some say much more than a million, but it's our job as historians to go back and do the hard slogging of sort of understanding, of reconstructing what happened, and maybe that can get us out of the log jam, which pays, uh, w which is still there in uh, the international relations of the Republic of Turkey and uh, the Ottoman Empire. And my 14th point, what are the things that might be, that, that need more research, that might be beefed up. Uh, I'll just quickly say, uh, it seems to me that more attention to demography, more attention to the great population movements, forced or, uh, or otherwise, usually forced migrations, and let's say the, uh, the period of the First World War itself, but there's a real need to go back to earlier, back at least to the 1870s and the, the great migration out, which is so uh, little understood, so little known of so many Muslims from formerly Ottoman uh, Balkans uh, and formerly Ottoman European territories into uh, the, the Middle East uh, at that time. Uh, and also, I'll, I'll end on this, Given my age, I'm not exactly uh, at home with postmodernism and uh, post-colonialism, post-toasties, you name it. Uh, but I am sympathetic to the w thrust of so many young historians of history from the bottom up. 
at the same time, as a would-be populist, as a liberal and all the rest, I still have to say, Dad, blame it, the world is constituted in such a way that like it or not, elites are more important than the rest of us. More important, not, not more significant, not nicer people, uh, not more deserving people, and things, just more important in being able to manipulate things. And so we can't do without your Saddam Husseins and Joseph Stalins and, and, uh, uh, and you can balance them uh, w with your Mandelas and your Gandhis and the like, but still it's those who are able to recruit a, a certain body of people, either within a state or, or you name it, to, uh, to take action uh, that matter. And one wants to be very careful about turning the very laudable history from the bottom up movement into downgrading or even ignoring the history of the people who really, for better or worse, uh, make the change. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thank you. Professor Brown, for this uh, rich, engrossing uh, talk. Thank you for reminding us. Uh, thank you for going boldly beyond Lawrence, uh, for reminding us of the bottom-up history uh, that's uh, as important as the study uh, of leaders. Uh, politically, uh, the history of the Middle East uh, in the First World War uh, that you spoke about, uh, political consequences, the Arab Revolt, for example. Uh, there's been wonderful scholarship on uh, the role of the Anglo-French naval blockade, on the starvation of half a million Syrians uh, um, as a result of, of uh, famine, uh, the locust plague, uh, Ottoman administrative uh, incapacity or Ottoman suspicions of loyalty or disloyalty in Syria. Um, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, have, I have many questions and uh, many comments on my own, but uh, Professor Brown has kindly agreed to uh, take questions, and the floor is now open for questions. Thank you very much for speaking. It was very interesting. Um, you mentioned sort of the, the international, well, at the time it was the empire, but the international uh, scope of the war. And I'm kind of curious, in terms of comparative histories, um, how historians can kind of maybe go a little bit deeper into looking at the experiences, not just of one empire, but sort of people across the spectrum in other areas besides just a single geographic entity. Well, you, you, you know, it's, it, it is, it's very interesting that just as there is a, a, a movement among many for history from the bottom up, there is a very stimulating, interesting movement of comparative empires these days. I, I, I think of one big book that I have at home. I can't remember the, uh, the, the co-authors right now. Uh, and, uh, and that seems to me to be... Uh, a very useful uh, approach. Uh, it's, it's not that we don't have a fair amount of theories out there, but I, I, I would suggest it's, it's very healthy to, to think in terms of a, of a, going back for the basics and shuffling of the cards again and, and having a look at it. Uh, let me just give you one example. Even more important is the way in which the history of nationalism has uh, uh, muted uh, uh, in, in a way. It's, it's no longer sort of seen as the 
total wave of the future. It is no longer uh, t taking rather simplistically the, the Woodrow Wilson notion of there are clearly identifiable nations out there, some of which are states and some of which haven't yet. Again, the, the man, the scholar called Benedict uh, Anderson, uh, the, the, the whole notion of imagined community uh, is a f fascinating uh, issue there. Uh, one thing that intrigues me uh, about, uh, I wonder if, if, we, if we can't do uh, a review of, of the literature, maybe bringing in anthropologists and uh, psychologists and, and the like, of sort of how and why people develop a loyalty to an empire. Or, and and, and, uh, and it, it, it's not easy, but I, I also find it fascinating it is, it is clear that throughout history, states have not had any trouble dragooning their own subjects, I won't say citizens, dragooning their own subjects into military service. But in some cases, as I mentioned in the talk, in some cases, they, they, they managed to create a rather co coherent, effective force, and in other cases not. Why? Again, when you talk about uh, the Ottoman army, I'm impressed by what they did in those years. The, the Ottoman army was impressive in mobilizing three million soldiers, putting peasants into uniform, but half a million of them deserted. <laughs> but when did they divert? Desert. Desert, I'm um, sorry. Uh, later in the war. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, it starts surprisingly early. Yeah, well, they should have deserted from the first day of the way they were being treated, <laughs> but somehow yeah. they didn't. And yeah. so, I mean, we, yeah. and just look at, I mean, the Ottoman Empire back in uh, the uh, uh, early uh, decades of the, of the 19th century was bested by Egypt's Muhammad Ali. Now, I don't want to sound too critical, but I think it's fair to say that there hasn't been a, an Egyptian military success since Muhammad Ali. Uh, and why? What happened? 